Hello and welcome. My name is Sloan Khalife, and I am the Outreach and Marketing Director for Federal Strategies at Race Forward. And I wanted to start by reading our organization's vision and mission. At Race Forward, our vision is a just, multiracial, democratic society, free from oppression and exploitation, in which people of color thrive with power and purpose. Our mission is to catalyze movement building for racial justice. To that end, we work in partnership with communities, organizations, and sectors to build strategies that advance racial justice in our policies, institutions, and culture. And in 2021, Raceport created federal, stra federal strategies, my team, to help federal agencies and departments center racial equity in their policies and practices. So we're honored and thrilled to be hosting um, this discussion for Come Hell or High Water, The Battle for Turkey Creek. Uh, the film is set in the Mississippi Gulf Coast, uh, and it is about a community that demonstrates solidarity and self-determination in the face of racial and environmental injustice. And as noted in the film, Turkey Creek is historic in that it was settled by formerly enslaved people after the Civil War. And I'm joined by an incredible panel we have Leah Mahan, the film's director and a documentary producer. We're also very fortunate to have a community leader, Kathy Eglin. Uh, she is also the NAACP board chair of environmental and climate justice. And last but not least, we're also speaking with Brian Joyner, deputy superintendent for Rock Creek Park for the National Park Service. Thank you all for being here. There's so much to appreciate about this film and I'm excited to dive in. I, I wanted to start with you, Leah. First of all, congratulations on the 10 year anniversary of Come Hell or High Water. And even with the passing of time, it's, it's clearly still relevant, which given the subject matter is in some ways unfortunate, but still very inspiring. Um, so to begin, um, I wanted to, to note that you and the primary subject, Derek, Derek Evans, first connected as interns uh, for the PBS documentary series, Eyes on the Prize, which some people would uh, consider the definitive history of the civil rights movement in the United States. So can you share a bit about how you would say the work you did for Eyes on the Prize influenced Come Hell or High Water? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, first I'll thank you very much. And I'm really excited to be talking to you all. And it's fun after a decade to, to know that the film is relevant and part of the conversation. So it's great to be here. Um, at Blackside, um, Derek and I were both really fortunate to find ourselves in the late 80s working for Henry Hampton, who was the executive producer of that series. Um, he'd first gotten the idea to make that series in the 60s when he was part of Bloody Sunday. Um, so he was on the bridge in, um, in Alabama watching events unfold and thought someone needs to document this. <laughs> and um, so um, Derek and I, through um, personal relationships that we had, we were introduced individually to Henry and um, came to be friends there. Um, and um, I can, there are so many ways that being there influenced us. Um, as I said, Henry was trying for decades to tell that story. And by the time we got there, he had gathered this incredible um, collection of people, filmmakers, scholars um, who were telling that story. Um, I think some of the ways I see connections are that Eyes on the Prize is about the foot soldiers of a movement and about um, not just you know the injustice, but the um, people who were turning that around and who were um, working sometimes without any recognition for years before their work led to the things that we ended up seeing in the news. You know, they were there all along and some of those stories were untold. And he was really interested in the, the strategy and the, the thinking that went into that kind of work. Um, also his commitment to research and to really understand deeply all of the issues and all of the history before you decide, okay, what story best encapsulates the important message that we wanna share. Um, these are stories of self-determination, 
um, stories of deliverance from injustice, um, and also the idea of place. I think both, obviously Derek knew this inherently, the importance of place, um, but I think understanding Mississippi in 1963 was so crucial to telling a story about what happened there. And, um, you know, what is a, what is a story without place and what is a place without story? I think that was something we really took to heart. Um, and I don't wanna go on too long, but lastly, um, Eyes on the Prize really uses um, a narrative approach. It, it's looking at history, but it's using stories and sort of a beginning, middle and end and kind of teasing out the dramatic structure of events. And I think that's something we took away from that. Um, and yeah, um, Derek and I were friends all those years and he was a teacher. I was making my first films and he had seen me doing that, making my films and invited me to come help him document the oral history of the place he grew up. And that's kind of how it started. And as a very louded environmental and climate justice, justice activist, I could ask you so many political questions, but I really just wanted to start by simply asking, what was it like for you to see your story told on film? Okay, so let me make a correction. I was not featured in the film. Uh, a lot of people that I know and I'm familiar with, um, a lot of people that are mentors, uh, a lot of people that give me so much inspiration are featured in the film. Um, and um, this story to me um, is uh, it's a story of resilience. It's a story of triumph over, diversity, over adversity. Uh, and uh, it's also a story of visionaries. And uh, when you look at these visionaries who are featured in this film, it gives you so much hope. It, it gives you so much inspiration. Um, and um, especially when you look at the perseverance, um, it just inspires you to keep keep moving and to never give up. Mm. I'm a resident of Gulfport, not Turkey Creek. Okay. I have to it in my community, but I am a <laughs> resident of Gulfport. <laughs> okay, yes. Okay, we'll go back to the uh, research drawing board on that. <laughs> Thank you for um, your, okay. your kindness. Um, Oh, I wanted to follow up um, because one important theme of the film is cultural preservation. Uh, Kathy, can you share what cultural preservation means to you? Um, cultural preservation is uh, basically preserving who you are, uh, where you come from, and where you plan to go. Uh, and it's always, you know, a lot of time people look to the past, uh, but when you have a vision and a positive vision, you look towards your future. And, and this is the impetus, being able to know your past, being able to see your story, being able to know your story uh, is an impetus to having a vision of where you want to go. Mm -hmm. And Brian, I also wanna bring you into the conversation about cultural preservation. As Americans, we are encouraged to think of business as the engine of the economy, and we do need business development. But in the case of Turkey Creek, we've seen what happens when capitalist interests overpower local communities. So for example, it was difficult to see that the development of an apartment building had encroached upon Turkey Creek Cemetery and graves had been paved over. So can you share your thoughts on the role of the federal government in ensuring cultural preservation, especially in historically black communities, um, is something indeed that is honored even when it conflicts with powerful interests? Sure. Um, I, I think one of the things that was striking about um, in the movie is that, um, you know, very early on in the narrative, you know, Derek recognized that getting Turkey Creek listed as a, uh, a district, a historic district, um, provided some level of protection um, for Turkey Creek and that, you know, um, the fact that it hadn't been listed previously, um, um, I thought it was um, interesting that at different points in the movie, people were like, oh, we didn't even know that place had a name, right? Um, mm -hmm. And let's be clear, um, we document what we value. So once it became valuable in, in, in the economic sense, Turkey Creek suddenly had a name, people knew where it was. Uh, mm -hmm. Before it was just some place that you know, was off the highway. 
or you know, or by you. But then suddenly it's like, oh, there's um, there's actually stuff here. There are people here. There's a culture here. Um, so in regards to federal government and documenting culture, we have the National Register of Historic Preservation. We have multiple uh, cultural preservation programs and historical documentation programs. Um, one of the things that does, when you think about the apartment building paving over, um, you know, going over top of the cemetery, one of the things that strikes me is that, you know, in the case of federal governments involved in a project, um, in any way, shape, or form. So let's say there's money from the federal government that goes towards creating um, creating a, a shopping mall, right? Um, and then the process of put, um, putting in that shopping mall, you discover graves of any type. You have to stop through the um, Historic Preservation Act, uh, Section 106 of the Historic Preservation Act says you have to stop, document, and then determine whether or not you can continue to go forward. Um, mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't always stop people from going forward with projects. Sometimes it alters them in some way. Sometimes it's just the, you know, the determination is that there's a mitigation that can be done to, to, to right the wrong of, you know, paving over that graveyard or something of that nature. But in, but if nothing else, it makes you document. And again, we document what we value. So the more these places that are documented, the more these places that are listed and on local, state, and national registers. Um, the more these stories are put out there and put put out there in such a way that suddenly you can no longer ignore them, it becomes that much more difficult to have what they tried to do with Turkey Creek happen, right? You know, because of no, if, because if you don't believe that those people have history, you don't believe those people have culture, that what there's there it has no value except for the economic value that you can extract from it, um, you know. You will all these places will be lost. All of the, all these neighborhoods will be lost. I mean, you know, sadly enough, that's not the first cemetery to get paved over. You know, uh, or you know, to get lost due to some project that was deemed, you know, for the greater good. Um, so um, the federal government's role in regard to the different programs it has. There's, you know, there are ways that we can help protect against these things happening. You know, the National Park Service, you know, happens to be where many of these programs live. Um, but there's also the role that, you know, grants to be able to help these communities um, in their documentation. I, I know that um, Turkey Creek received about half a million dollars um, back in 2018, I believe it was, uh, for the Paymaster's House um, as part of the Civil Rights uh, Grant Project. So, you know, that legislation went in. Um, 2017, 2018 um, creates a way to, you know, help communities like Turkey Creek preserve something like the Paymaster's House that is a significant location that then creates that much more of a presence for the historic district. So it becomes that much harder. And, you know, there were other things that went into preserving that historic district, uh, the, that area as well, conservation easement, you know, there's um, in danger, um, the, uh, there's a birth, um, birth fly zone, I believe, over top of, um, in that area that was um, part of the preservation. Um, all those things are important and the, all those things help to create a significance for those places. And again, the more you document, the more it's valued. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I wanted to, building on the idea of documenting, uh, Leah, go back to uh, the idea of story. And I, I'm paraphrasing you slightly, but I, I've heard you say the telling of the story becomes part of the story and the telling of the story can change things. So can you share uh, perhaps one important way you think the film has helped create change in Turkey Creek? Mm -hmm. um, well, and I was actually paraphrasing Derek, who probably <laughs> said that first about the telling the story, changing the story. And something that he always said was that, um, you know, certainly in the beginning when they were trying to fight the city's plans, um, all they had was their story and their relationships. Um, but that was, you know, that was a really powerful set of resources actually, if you figured out how to use them, <laughs> um, which they did. Um, and um, I think early on, 
um, the film actually had an impact in the making of the film because uh, there was a moment, there was an early, um, well, you see in the film when the mayor um, says that the people standing in the way of his development plans were a bunch of dumb bastards. Um, and he was actually responding to the fact that um, the Sierra Club through Rose Johnson was drawing a lot of attention to their struggle and to their opposition to plans. And so um, they had he held a press tour um, of the creek and the flooding and I was the only camera there. Um, a, a newspaper journalist showed up later, um, but the mayor was very angry that this other side of the story was getting attention and he wanted to make clear what his side of the story was. And he ended up making that statement to the reporter that became, you know, the way the story was reported and led to a lot of things. Um, so even early on, just the presence of the camera and the fact that the story was being told um, changed things in a way. There was a meeting about the road. Also, I remember Rose Johnson told me that um, they showed some sample footage that we had early on at a meeting about the road and it really changed the conversation. So, um, and since the film's been out, I mean, um, I think what it did was just amplify the story so that there were more eyes, more witnesses um, to what was going on so that business as usual as it had been conducted in Gulfport and in the state of Mississippi, um, there are now more people, more allies um, listening and watching. Um, and I think maybe concretely that uh, one of the examples that Brian gave, um, you know, they they got funding to create a museum and it's dedicated to the labor history of that area. You see in the film, um, the lumber industry and the, um, the creosote factory that was in the neighborhood. And, um, and Derek managed to buy this building, uh, later found out that it had been used as the company store for um, one of the businesses and, you know, turned that into an opportunity to create a museum with some federal funds. Um, and I think um, along the way, um, just having that recognition, it was on public television, it was at festivals. I actually went to Indonesia with it through this program called the American Film Showcase. And I was, in, I was just amazed at how much people identified with the story and with Derek because um, because it is such a human story about someone trying to protect um, the place they come from and the, you know, the ecology of the place and they could really identify with, with him. Um, I, I'll just give, it's hard to say concretely, you know, one thing leads to another, but just recently, um, Kathy and I shared a clip about Rose Johnson, who was her mentor and one of my mentors um, uh, with hundreds of staff of the Sierra Club who are interested in you know, keeping her legacy alive. She was the first African-American chairperson of the, of the Sierra Club in Mississippi. And, um, and so there are ways that we're keeping those legacies alive. A number of the people in the film are no longer with us. Um, so Derek's goal of really capturing some of the oral history um, already that's you know so important because people are no longer around to tell the stories. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I really wish we had more time because this is a very rich discussion. Um, but since we do have to wrap, Kathy, I want it to end with you. I'm going to paraphrase someone else, uh, the journalist, Nicole Hannah-Jones. She once said, the story of Black America is not a story of defeat, but a story of ascension. And Kathy, I, with that in mind, I'm curious, what would you say um, is your big radical vision for Turvey Creek and coastal Mississippi in general? Well, my radical vision, and I think the uh, vision of the Turkey Creek community is to continue to be resilient, is to continue the legacy um, of their ancestors. And, and I've seen this, um, the community, um, this, this story is just um, 
unimaginable and it has an unimaginable worth. You can't put a value on this. Um, mm -hmm. You can't put a value. I noticed, Leah, uh, some of the young people on that Sierra Club uh, meeting that we had, uh, when they first they told me they wanted to hear Rose's voice, was there any footage? And so I reached out to Leah and she was kind enough to have this footage. And Rose is telling this story in her own voice, uh, talking about how she was baptized in Turkey Creek. And um, I know whenever I go by the creek now, uh, and you're looking, you're not just looking at the creek itself, you're looking at the stories, you're looking at the historical value, you're looking at the fact that um, emancipated individuals had this vision of a community. And, and the community actually has this determination that they're going to continue in that vein and continue to confront every challenge uh, and continue to be victorious in doing so. Mm. That was a great way to conclude. Thank you. And thank you all again for your time today, Leah, Kathy, and Brian. Um, and thank you viewers for watching. Um, as a reminder, the dates of the film festival are March 16th through March 26th. And you can learn more about other uh, amazing films at dceff.org. And for more information about Race Sport, you can visit raceport.org. And thanks again for watching. Thank you.